So, so far we have been dealing with what is called propositional calculus, with propositions. And remember, a proposition is a statement that is either true or false. Now, that gives us doesn't give us much leeway. A lot of things are hard to say with just propositions. Right? A proposition is a single statement, but very often we want, we want to make more general statements, like we want to say, um, all students in this class uh, have passed the first test, something like that. But, okay, that's a statement we can make. Um, it's a proposition, for sure. Um, but now, suppose um, I'm, I'm thinking about this thing and I'm saying, okay, so... I'm making a statement about students passing this class and perhaps in the next test some students will pass, pass the, the test and the others will not. So how am I going to make that kind of division? How, how will I incorporate that? And so that's the idea of a predicate. So that's the first thing that we have to, to call, talk about, a predicate. And it's something also called um, a propositional function. or propositional function. And so what it, what it is, is, but what is the difference is, okay, it is a statement about a variable. And that variable can take, then, then, then we can decide what that variable is. So here's a, a, an, an example. Student X has passed uh, quiz two. Let's call it quiz two. That's this is a. So now, is this a proposition? No, because I don't know what x is. This it depends on x whether this is true or false. Okay. So and uh, before we we when remember logic is not about making a particular proposition or a particular statement. It is about truths about um, using propositions, is it's about how to juggle propositions. What can you do with propositions? Put them together. What are the, what are the rules of working with propositions? So the objects are for us propositions, and now we want to expand this, and also predicates. So this is a predicate, and we're going to talk about predicates, and Often we want to make statements that are true for no matter, not, not just for this particular predicate, but for any predicate. So we're going to give names to these variables, and so we call this P. But of course, P has in itself this variable X, and so we will denote this by PX. So P is the name of the predicate, and X indicates that the predicate depends on this extra variable X. Okay? And so now we can... So why is this now called a propositional function or predicate? Because it is not a proposition. But once you plug in, so let's say P of uh, Janice is true, because Janice passed the quiz. But Eric unfortunately didn't. These are just a random name, so don't feel anything. Don't feel if you happen to have this name. So Eric could be false. Okay, so the values that these takes will is therefore true or false, but remember, although the textbook writes this as T and F, we're going to just always keep writing them as 1 and 0. So I remind you, this is true, and this means false. So it is a function that operates on objects, on, on, on these members of a certain collection, over which this variable X runs. So this X is in what we call in a domain. And the domain means there are all the allowed access. So in this, in this case, we had in mind that the, an X is a student in this class. So if you want all the domain of this statement, the domain, in other words, the accepted inputs for X is the students in this class. So for instance, P of uh, the moon, is not allowed. Is uh, is not allowed because the moon is not a student in this class. Okay. So when we talk about a predicate, we always have to know kind of what is also the domain. What are the axes in this domain? Okay. So um, 
but we don't often don't de denote this. And I will talk about this later, that the domain actually is important to, to kind of know also what the domain is. And then and, uh, a question should be complete, can, is only really complete if it also tells you what the domain is. Okay, but let's go back to, um, not so much, this is weird things, let's talk about really normal things like this, um, predicates. So we can call them predicates. It's an older term and uh, it means that you predicate, it means that you can predicate about something. You're predicating something about X, namely that, it, that X has passed quiz 2. Okay, so here are examples of uh, predicates. X is bigger than 3. Now, of course, again, talking about the domain, right? Here, the dom X is apparently must be numbers. Now, I haven't said, and this is that's what I'm saying, often we, we X. We um, imply a certain domain, and but th this could be the domain of all real numbers, but the domain could also be all natural numbers or all rational numbers. And of course, this makes a difference. Okay, that's a, this is an example of a predicate. Now, this is so far. I've given only predicate depending on one variable. But once you think about these things, there's no reason to do that, right? So why not make this thing x plus y equals five? That's Again, a predicate, but this time we have two variables. And it becomes a... So, a predicate becomes a proposition when you plug in values, accepted, acceptable values, inputs, for the variables, or for all the variables, if I plug in. So, what happens? See, if suppose I plug in x equals 3 in this. So, let's call this predicate, let's call it, uh, again, p. But now, depending on x and y. So what is p, 5y? So this says 5 plus y is 5. Now, don't think, of, don't think about what it says. Okay, I know this means that y is 0, but that's not what we're talking about. For us, this is some statement, right, about numbers that we don't know much about. God knows, perhaps in the, for these numbers, there are many numbers that, that have this property. So, p, 5y, is this a proposition? No, because it still depends on y. So it is still a predicate. So only when you plug in values for all the variables, you get a proposition. Okay, so that's what um, predicates are. Now, there's a lot of uh, nice examples in the textbook, which I'm going to go let read this to you, and you can do um, explore a little bit this, but we will come to the crux of the matter here right away, and that is talking, let's talk about quantifiers. See, um, remember our first, my first statement that I made was using this PX, well, is, or, all students passed quiz 2. How can I now express this? Now, remember I said all students passed quiz 2 is a proposition, because it's either true or false. I mean, assuming that quiz 2 has already passed, right? We, we are in, in the, in the time that quiz 2 has already been taken and, and been graded. So... All students have passed quiz 2 is a proposition, meaning it is true or false. It's not a predicate. There is a variable mentioned in there, but it kind of dis disappears because I'm saying all students. So how will we write this up? And this is, we will, the, the more formal way to say this is, we will say for all x, px. So for all x, the student X has passed quiz 2. That's how we will formally write it. Now, we don't write for all X. So that's, what we, that's how we pronounce it. But we write it as this way. So for all X, PX. In fact, in the book, they don't put uh, this column there, which I find a little bit weird. But there are so many different conventions when it comes to logic. They are very similar, and it's like it, it, it encoding, right? Sometimes some languages are very particular on, on the punctuation marks, and others are not. So sometimes I will write a colon, the book, do, book doesn't, so be a little bit flexible with this thing. I, I won't hold you on any of this, okay? So this is how we will express, so I'll, I'll repeat, this is how we express for all x, px, in the case of... This proposition, this would mean, for all students, x has passed quiz 2. In other words, all students have passed quiz 2. Of course, in English, we abbreviate this a little bit. We make this a bit more compact, right? But that's the 
difference between English and formal mathematics or formal logic. All right. Now, it was therefore important to know what a domain was, because I said, for all x, p, x, suppose that the domain was not the students in the class, but there was all people on Earth. Well, that's kind of... What do you think then? All people on Earth has pa have passed quiz 2. So every x, for every pe person on Earth, the person x has passed quiz 2. Probably not, right? Because many of them won't have taken the, the test. So that means that would be a false statement then. Okay? Of course, the statement would also be false if we were in this situation. And where x now just is the students in this class. Janice and Eric are students in this class. But why is this? So let's think about it. Is this statement true? If this is the situation, there are only two, two students in this class, and this is the results. Is the statement true? This, is this statement true? No, because it says all x, px. Whereas we have here Janice, fine, she passed, but Eric didn't. Okay? So the meaning for all x really means every single x in the domain satisfies px. That's what we, the other way we say that. And uh, if somebody does not, so, so this is, in, in this situation, right, I said this is false. Remember, when I put a for all, we call this a quantifier. So, okay, so I should, let's do, bring in some names. A quantifier, I found quant, quanting, how much, right? Um, this is a quantifier. There is another one. But this is the, the one that we call the quantifier. Once I put a quantifier in front of a predicate, it becomes a proposition. In other words, it becomes true or false. If I say all students are past the quiz one, it's either true or false. In this particular case that we are looking in, the purple case, it is false. And why false? Because P of Eric is zero. And to be true, it should be, all of them should be one. Right? So we call Eric a counterexample. It's an important concept um, that we will see in many different uh, situations. So a counterexample to a universal statement. Oh, yeah. So this we call a universal statement. So a little bit of terminology because I'm going to say these things. I'm so used to using these things. I'm a logician, remember? Oh, no, I didn't tell you this, but I'm actually a logician. Part, part of my training is a logician. And so I use this, these things all the time. So universal statement is a statement in which we use the quantifier for all. And so if you have a universal statement, um, and if that statement is false, that means there is a counterexample. There is an example that shows it's not. That's what a counterexample means. Okay? Now... You could say, what about this? This is an example. Yes, that's an example that, pe that, some, that there are some people that um, pass the class, but not all. That leads me, that's a segue into the other quantifier. There's another quantifier. Instead of for all x, let's go to what I'm just trying to say. There is an x. There's somebody, some x passed this class. So this would be the statement, some x or there is an x such that px. Again, we don't want to write things. It's called symbolic logic also. And so we're going to make a, a symbol. This is the symbol. And so this is called... A, so this we call a universal statement and we call this the universal quantifier. This we call an existential. Quantifier. And the statement we call then an existential statement. Okay. Why, why existential? Well, another, even another way of saying this, there exists. There's a little bit more than there is, right? There exists. It means the same in English, but it, it somehow reinforces the actual being there and an, an example, right? So what about the, let's look at our purple situation. Oh, sorry, it's this. This, in the, in the purple situation, so in this class with two people, do you think this is true? 
Yes, because Janus is now an example. Remember, I already said it, right? It's an example that this makes this statement true. So let me perhaps add this. So we had said that the previous one was false because the for all was false, but this is now true. Or one. Okay. Okay, so uh, there are two new symbols and introduced. So you might ask where does it come from? What, are, what kind of weird things? I, I don't even have that on my, on my, on my type. Uh, on my, how can I type this in? Yeah, you cannot. That's why you have to write your solutions, right? It's, I mean, you have to have a pr pretty sophisticated um, program actually to put this for all and there is in. And what is it? Where did this come from? Let's let's quickly look at it. This one. What is it? What does it look like? Uh, I was gonna turn around my iPad, but you won't see that I turn it around. So it's, that was a, a stupid thing to do. So if you turn this around, you get this right. All. And what happens if you turn this one around? So if you turn it around, if you turn it around, you get this one. Exists. Okay. So that's where these two come from. And so make sure that you know which one is what, right? Okay. So that is what a quantifier is. So quick, 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 quick repeat. We have a predicates that are functions that are either true or false, depending on what the value of x is. And then predicates make a statement about either all of the axes or about one of the axes. Now, I want to discuss this a little bit more. You might say, yeah, but didn't we just say that Eric is a counterexample to the fact that uh, everybody passed the quiz? Why is it not a counterexample for this? In this statement, I'm not claiming that all. I'm only claiming there is one, or at least one. Okay, be, be careful. So, now you might ask, okay, what about this? Suppose now we have a third person in class. Here, let's add, add the class. And so let me get a little bit rid of this guy and a little bit of my blue. So I'm going to make a new class and get rid of this red guy also. Okay, so P of N is also one. Okay. So, so now we have an, another class. I'll make the class in uh, green. So in my green class, this is what happens. Janice, Eric, and N, that's the results that they have. Uh, where does this come from? Okay. Uh, okay, so what about the first statement? For all x, px. So what about this statement? So uh, let me do it right. This statement. It is still false, right? Because Eric remains a counterexample in this case. Uh, sorry, a counterexample in this case. Okay. What about this statement? You say, oh, it's not true because you say that there is an x. But there is actually many x, Janice and n. That's okay. That is still makes it true. As long as there's one. Okay? As long as we have one example, it makes it true. Okay? So, let me change the class again. Okay? Let's make the class now. Um, make, make, let's make a better class. So, let's suppose that this is the case. Now, Eric, and let's, perhaps it was quiz 3, Eric now also passed the class, so let's make this the, what, what is your favorite color? Not brown, so, no, or this is gray, I don't know what this is. Okay, what about this class? For all x, px, what do you think? Now this is true because everybody has passed the test. What about this one? Well, it's still true, right? Because there is an x, yes, because there are many x's, okay? So, what about the now last class? Okay, last situation. Suppose we are in a situation where unfortunately I made the test too hard and everybody failed in this class. So this is the black class, or the gray class. Make this the gray. See, this was gray, and the other one was brown. What about this? Is this true? No, it's far from true because actually every single guy is a counterexample. But okay. There is no measure here. It's true or false, right? And so this is false. What about now this guy? It's also false because there is no single example. Everybody has failed. So there is an XPX. It's not true. Okay. I think this makes it more than obvious what, what what's goes on. So I don't want to spend too much time anymore explaining this. I'm going to let you read a lot of these things. Um, 
and, and, and look at first many uh, examples that we will do in also in the homeworks. Okay, so um, what I now want to say is um, yeah, I'm gonna yeah, so we have to talk about logical equivalences now, okay? And a very important one, so remember, a logical equivalence is a, a statement, so I remind you, P is logically equivalent with Q, means that, um, if, uh, these are remember, these are propositional formulas, right? So propositional formula, uh, I don't know how we denoted these, but okay, P and Q. So this might be a complicated thing, right? It's not just one single proposition, it's like, could something be like A and B or not C implies D or A and imply something like that. Remember, we have seen quite complicated things. And we say two, two such expressions are logically equivalent if no matter what truth values the, 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 the components have, both are the same. Okay, that was logically equivalent. So, Here's an example now of something that involves quantifiers and, and a very important one here. So let's look at this. Suppose we are talking about this proposition. Remember, so P is a predicate. So Px is a predicate. And therefore, for all x, Px is a proposition. So it's true or false. Now, if we don't know what a predicate is, we don't know this, right? But that's the whole point. We work with these things even not knowing what they actually refer to. Okay. One thing I want to do is I want to say what's the negative of that. Okay. So in an in example of class, of our passing the class, the statement was all students pass the class. Right? All uh, Sorry, pass the quiz. All students pass the quiz. If we negate this means it's not true that all students pass the class. What does that mean then? That means, remember here was an example, well, I have raised my examples. Well, here, this is example, the gray one is still an example, right? In fact, there were so many counterexamples. Every single guy was a counterexample to the statement for all x, px. Okay, so um, that means, in other words, so let me say, if I say it's not true that all students passed the quiz, means there is a student who did not pass the quiz. So how would I write that? So. Do not pass the quiz is the negation of Px, right? And I'm saying there is a student. Right? So I now quantify the negation of this predicate. Now, what is the negation of a predicate? Of course, it is what, it, what it's supposed to be, right? Remember, a predicate takes either true or false. So if the original predicate was true for a given x, for a particular value for x, then not P of x will be false for that, and, and vice versa. And so what I'm saying is, that the expression not, so this expression here, this expression, it's not true that for all x, px, and there is an x so that not px actually are logically equivalent. Meaning that no matter what p, what kind of predicate you plug in here, it doesn't have to be about students, it doesn't have to be, it could be about numbers, it could be about a database, it could be anything. No matter what you plug in there, this the left-hand side and the right-hand side are always either both true or both false. And that means what meaning logically equivalent. Okay, And this is a very important law. This is the negation of quantification. So notice a little bit what happens. This memorize, remember this because we're going to talk about it soon um, in a more complicated situation. The not... I'm going to move the knot inside here, so that's what happens, right? Here it's inside. But by doing that, I flip the quantifier. So for all becomes there is. Why do I say that? Well, let's look at what would happen if I would do the... So let me put parentheses here to make sure that what that is clear what I'm negating. What's the negation of the fact? It's not true that there is an xpx. That means, that's for instance, um, what, yeah, so... What is the, it's not true that there is an xpx. You could say that should be, this is logically equivalent to for all x, it's not px, right? That is, has the same content, at least that's what we feel like it's true. I mean, a lot of these things we're just gonna state, we're not gonna prove these things, right? Okay, so um, 
what happens here look what happened to the to this negation i want to bring the negation inside that's happened here but if i do this i flip the quantifier that's what we call flipping the quantifier means a for all becomes an exist and an exist becomes a for all all right so and this is such an important system of 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 um logical equivalences it has a name and the name is something we have a guy we have already uh, encountered the morgan so the Morgan gave the Morgan laws is uh, so this is the Morgan law for quantifiers. So the Morgan law for quantifiers. So a quick quick test. Who remembers what the Morgan laws were? The previous guys were what they're about. They were about negations of conjunctions and disjunctions. And a kind of similar thing happened, right? A conjunction. If you want to move the not inside, so remember not. P and Q, that's the Morgan law for uh, uh, conjunction, was, well, okay, you negate both, but then you flip the conjunction into a disjunction, the end into an OR, and the same if you do this with, if you start with a conjunction, negate it, then the result is, uh, sorry, a disjunction, then you get, you get a conjunction. Okay. Good. So, there are, of course, many more logical equivalences involving quantifiers, but this is a particularly important one, okay? And therefore, um, I'm going to just mention this one for now. We will later talk about more other things, okay? Um, there are many examples in the textbook, and I'm going to let you read about them, and there are also going to be homework problems to test your understanding of these notions. But I want to move on. You'll, you notice that there was uh, two sections mentioned, right? So I'm going to go to 1.5, and 1.5 is called nested quantifiers. What the hell is that? Mm -hmm. Now we're going to... It's not enough that we have them. Now we're going to even put them in a nest and what, breed, breed them? No, no, it's not that. Let's return to a very early example of a quantifier, this case. This had two variables, okay? So suppose I now want to make a statement like that. I want to say, okay, I want to make this, remember, a predicate with two variables. It's not a proposition at all. You have to fit a value for x and a value for y. So, yeah, so perhaps, sorry, let me backtrack. Very quickly, if you have a predicate with one variable, there are two ways of making a proposition out of it. One way was plugging in a value for this proposition, right? And somebody, a concrete value for x. Then it became a proposition. And now quantification gave me this, these two, putting this quantifier in front of it, also made a proposition of it and a different type. Okay, so you can think of this quanti quantifier as a ways of making new propositions. And of course, that's the whole point, right? I, I, remember, I started this lecture by saying a lot of things we cannot really express yet by propositions. And now with quantifiers, we can. So what about nested quantifiers? How can I make now, with out of this statement involving two variables, uh, a proposition? Remember, if it has two variables, and in a proposition, there should be no variables. So I have to quantify them both. Okay, so let's look at an example of what I can do. I could say, for all x, that there is a y, x plus y equals 5. I could also say, there is an x, such that for all y, x plus y is 5. I could also say, for all x, for all y, x plus y is 5. Or I could also say for all y, for all x, x plus y is 5. Now, now as I'm at it, I, will, I want to do this. There is an y, oops, and there is an x, so that x plus y equals 5. I could also write there is an x, there is a y, x plus y is 5. And I think there are two more possibilities I have not written down. Namely, for all y, there is an x, x plus 1 is 5. And then for all, uh, no, sorry. Can you see which one I'm missing? All possible combinations I could if well I'm claiming here that somehow the order in which I write them is important we'll talk, talk about that right but a priori there are, there's one more combination namely the one that I have there is a y for all x I think they're all the combinations that I have now well if you want to count the number of combinations right is there are basically these four you have 
this, 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 and this quantifier, and then there are so many ways of putting them together. Okay. So, what about these things? Do they have different meaning? Well, let's, let's think about it, whether they're true or not, perhaps. That, that will tell us a lot, right? If they're not all true, then definitely they're not, or not all are false. If they're true and false is different, then they, they must be different statements, right? Okay, so what about the first one? For all x, there is a y, x plus y is 5. How do we verify this? Now, this, be, be careful, this is not easy to verify in general, okay? It's, uh, quantifiers are very difficult to handle. Because in theory, like when I make a statement like all students pass this test, well, I have to look at all the students. There's no other way to do this. If I just, if I just uh, hope that this is true, that's not enough. I really have to check every single student to see whether he has, uh, whether he had passed the test. Of course, if he, if it's not true, if the statement is false, if there's a counterexample, I might find that quicker, right? That's a bit quicker because I only have to give the one counterexample. But coming back here, so. How do we this do this? So what you have to imagine is, well, let's see what the statement, we have to, as usual with English, we read from left to right, we read it this way. So it says, for all x, there is a y, so the x plus y is 5. So that means that if I give you, so you can think of this actually as a little bit as a game. And that's sometimes what we say, uh, we think of these quantifiers. So this quant guy is giving you an arbitrary x, so say 7. And now there is a y, x plus y is 7. Now you have to, can you solve this game now? If, you, if I give 7, can you find the y that so, so, so satisfies this? Well, y equals negative 2 will satisfy this, right? So if you think a little bit about, I mean, okay. That is assuming that the domain, so I have to be, that this is where the domain is important, right? The domain, let's call the domain the, uh, the integers. So these are the numbers 0, plus, minus 1, plus, minus 2, etc. We'll talk about the integers much more later, but this is how they are denoted, z. I'll tell you later why it isn't denoted, denoted that way. So, we are talking about these guys. Okay, so, if I give you any, so in other words, what is this game, how does the game work, is you, this guy picks any number in here, and then this guy has to come up with another number in here, satisfy, make me satisfy. But if you think a little bit, that's going to work, right? Whatever number this guy gives, well, by solving this, by bringing this x to the other side and bringing minus x, right? So perhaps the way to convince you is if y is equal to 5 minus x, right? If I bring it to the other side, that means that no matter what x you give me, I can calculate 5 minus x and that's the y. So the result, the, the, the conclusion is, let's, sorry, make this a truth table. Is this true or false? So this one is true, okay? Oops, sorry. I'm not going to go all of them, but you'll, because I will explain very quickly what, what goes on. But here's a crucial one. What about this one? You say, oh, that's kind of the same statement, or perhaps even a little bit better. Let's look at this one, because it uses the same quantifiers, right, but just in a different order. So let's look at this one. Now, you see there's a symmetry here in some sense that, therefore, it doesn't matter whether I, this, if this is true, then this must be true, because you just flip x and y. This is the standard things you can do with, with variables, right? You can rename them. Okay, but here, let's look at this guy, which is the same as this guy, except that the order is different. So is the order important or not? Let's look. There is a y for all x. So if you want to play this game, the first player, because you remember we go from left to right, right? The first player has to give a y. At this point, now, he has to give me a y. Give me the y. Okay, okay, uh, three. Okay, he gives me three. And then for all x, x plus three equals five. That's bullshit, right? Sorry for the word, but there's too many x's here. There's only one x that will work. X is two, yeah, but all x? No way, right? So this is clearly false. And this is really indicating that the order of the quantifiers is important. And so... 
That's why we call them nested quantifiers in the sense, in sense it is a nest, it is the, there's an order, a nested order. That's sometimes um, a way of describing the fact that, that things are um, cannot be moved around. So if you read it this way, or if you read it this way, you get different results. Now, some of these are not, okay? Uh, for all x, for all y, those two actually doesn't matter what the predicate is. Now, let's look at this here. For all x, for all y, x plus y is 5. Do you think this is true? Well, let's play the game. For all x, I'm the first player, I can give you any x. I'm giving you 100. Now, you have to counter, not just by 1, that was easy, but all of them. So any number you have to give now must satisfy this 100 plus y equals 5. Again, not going to happen, right? So this is, statement is false. Now for the same reason, the next statement is false, kind of symmetry, right? But the point is, so as a logical equivalence, so another logical equivalence for all x, for all y, pxy. Now remember, we have now predicates which have two variables. Of course, there could be more, but let's talk about two variables. This is logically equivalent to for all i, for all x, pxy. Let's try to convince ourselves that. The first side says, for every x and for every y, you can find you, this is true. What it says, for every y and for every x, this is true. But if you say this and that, you can change the order, right? This is really what we call commutativity of end. For all x and for all y is the same as for all i and for all x. You're just saying in a different order, but it doesn't make a difference. Okay? So this is another example of a logic uh, equivalence involving quantifiers. But I remind you, for all x there is a y, pxy is not logically equivalent, but there is a y for all x. So while we can the order of two universal quantifiers is unimportant. The order of a universal and an existential is important. What do you think about this group? Well, let's first see in this particular case. There is a y and there is an x. x plus y is 5. Is this true or not? Again, as always, stop this video, pause the video, think about it, and see then whether your answer was correct or not. Well, how do you play this game? There is a y. So I have to give a y, I give zero, I want to think, I'm thinking of being nasty, and now the, the second player has to answer with an x. Z, this is a y, so this was zero, x plus zero is five, yes, he can find an x, he can find x five. So yes, this is going to be true in this particular case, in this particular case, right, we're talking about a very concrete um, um, a predicate here, and again, if you think a little bit about it, the order doesn't matter here. So also this is going to be true. I'll leave the two other ones up to your imagination to see what happens here. So what we do have is also that it doesn't matter in which order I put two existential quantifiers. And for the same reason, right, so just spell it out in English. There is an x and there is a y such as pxy. That's the same thing as saying there is a y and there is an x, such as pxy. Again, the order of this in which we say and is not important. Okay, so this is, and this is why it's important that the quantifiers cannot be always swift around. In, 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 in two of the three cases we can, but it's the, this is the tricky one, where you cannot. And since we can write these two in any order we want, very often we will just write it this way, for all x, y, p, x, y. Okay, you could say, okay, how do you have to read this, for all x, for all y, for all y, for all x? I'm just saying it doesn't matter, because whichever way is logically equivalent. But this one I cannot abbreviate, because it's different from that one. Okay, I hope you got this far um, thinking about this. Um, Right, and then, then this is, I think this is almost everything that I want to say. Ah, yeah, right, so negating, the, let's do the Morgan laws. So the Morgan for nested quantifiers. Well, 
I mean, it's a fancy word for saying more than one quantifier. And I said here, I did the two case of two, but I hope you can imagine what three and four and so on would be. As many variables you can, if you have a, let's say, a predicate consisting of four variables, why not? Could be, right? In order to make this into a proposition, you have to put a bunch of quantifiers, one for each. So one, there is a Y, so that's for all Z, and for all T, there is an X. And that would make it. So when we, what, what happens? So remember when we would, um, I, well, let's go back to this particular example here. For all X, uh, X plus Y is 5. We said this is not, a, uh, it's not a, a proposition because, but it is still a predicate, right? Because it depends still on Y. You say, but there is an X in there. Yes, but the quantifier, and we will say, X is bounded. That's the way that we have by the quantifier. And there are two quantifiers. It could be bounded in two ways. It can be bounded as being all, or it could be bounded as one, right? For all, or there exists. So, and repeating now what I said, is when I have a, predic a, a predicate, say, depending on four variables, in order to make it into a proposition, I have to bound all four variables in some way, with either using existential or a, a universal, in uh, whichever way I want. Okay, that would make it into a proposition. Okay, so now the Morgan laws for negation. So what's the negation? Let's do one of the hard, the, the one that we cannot switch the variables. Remember, this is the case where we cannot switch the variable. Well, let's think about this. As I said, let me um, use uh, this color here. This whole thing in pink here, what is this? Is it a predicate or is it a proposition? Since it, the P depends on two variables and I bound it using this quantifier, only the variable Y, it is still a predicate depending on the variable X. So this is still a predicate. Okay? So now, by our De Morgan law, this one, I can, I'm going to apply this. It means I bring the not inside. So let's do that. So that is four... Oh, ah, but sorry, oh, 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 oh. if you do that, you have to flip the quantifier. So not for all, I have to write there is. This is an X. And then the quantifier is inside. Now what I'm quantifying, the whole pink expression, there is a Y, P, X, Y. Ah, but now this, this negation wants to be really in go inside, right? So I have to do this one more time. Oh, I have another the Morgan law for this too. This is the Morgan law involving the variable x, but remember, variables can always get renamed. So this is now the same thing for y. So what happens? Remember, bringing this guy inside, I will have to switch, flip the quantifier, and then put negation. So you could make it quicker and say, let me get rid of the color here if that dis disturbs. So you could now, quicker way of saying this is if you bring a Oh, sorry, this is still on. If you bring, um, want to bring a negation inside the quantifiers, it's okay. Each time you pass a quantifier, flip it. And that's the uh, whole secret of the thing. And of course, this is for this group of quantifiers, but this is true for any group of quantifiers. This so if I do this, this if I negate this, this would become an existential, this would become an existential. So what happens if I negate something like this? Remember, this is just shorthand for this. And therefore, the negation of this would be, so let me just write it up. So the negation for all x, y, p, x, y, p, x, y, that is logically equivalent with that exists x and y. I'm flipping this quantifier twice, once for x, once for i not p x y and i put the column again there which i was not supposed to do okay okay so that's uh, everything that i want to say about predicates and quantifiers now but we're going to use them uh, in our in logical reasoning we're gonna the next topic is going to be um uh, foundations uh, rules of inf inference yeah that is where logic really starts the rules of inference